Welcome back, listeners. This is your host, Owen Patterson, and I'm here today with Jack B. Weiss. Do you want to give yourself an introduction and kind of explain to our listeners what it is that you do? Uh, yes, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Jack V. Weiss. I do a, <laughs> I do a little bit of everything in fashion. Um, I started off with a vintage clothing store named Back by Popular Demand. Um, it's not a brick and mortar store, I wish, but um, I mostly do Depop now. I used to have my own website, but I started that sophomore year of high school. Um, before I get down to that rabbit hole, I also do a uh, freelance fashion design agency that's targeted towards startup streetwear brands and independent designers. Um, I like to help clients that have almost no knowledge in the fashion industry, and I like to uh, kind of cast myself as a bridge in which they can kind of go into the industry and um, someone that will help them not get screwed over by factories, um, make sure that they have good tech packs and they can appear professional so they're less likely to get screwed over and get discouraged and just close any gaps in their knowledge that they may have. Um, things such as that, graphic design, freelance fashion design, that kind of thing. And then I also have my own clothing brand. It's called HRMTG. Um, it stands for Historical Reinterpretations Made Through Garments, and those are historical inspired. Uh, I consider them almost art pieces. Um, a lot of emphasis is placed upon the printmaking on those and creating individual garments. And that is has been going on since this summer, this last summer. And uh, I do everything myself right now, but um, everything's made in the USA and I have a lot of plans with that for the future. So that's basically, basically a rundown of the three major things that I do. And I'm, uh, I'm in college right now, so I'm also a college student. Really cool. All right, well, we're gonna dive into all that stuff a little bit later, but first I kind of want to talk about, I guess the way that we got connected uh, was by you reaching out to me. So. That was a nice opportunity yes. and I just wanted to be able to get back into podcasting. This is my first one I've done in a little bit and it was a nice to have that kind of push mm -hmm. from you and also really want to kind of learn more about what it is that you're doing and maybe what you have planned for the future. But before that, I want to ask you for uh, some icebreaker questions. So these are going to be just some maybe one word answers, or they're gonna be something a little bit more challenging. Maybe we even get deep, but who knows, all right? The first one's gonna be, in certain situations, do you see yourself responding in a fight or flight type of action? You said I'd flight? Say fight. I said fight. Fight? fight? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's a good reaction to have. And do you consider yourself someone who binge watches shows or spreads out the episodes? Spreads out the episodes. That's pretty good. I don't know if I've met too many people that do that. What do you think? Do you just have a lot of discipline or what's the deal? Not enough time to watch it all in one go? Um, yeah, I'm weird. Like, I watch the episode as soon as it comes out. Because, like, if I watch a show, I, like, fiend for the new episode. So I can't binge it all at once. Like... I don't know. I guess obviously it's an older show. I can do that, but I really only watch like newer shows sometimes. I don't know. It's weird, but yeah, I like to spread them out. Um, right. It's kind of more fun and, that way. And are you a day person or a night person? Definitely a night person. Like early morning, like one to three a.m. <laughs> yeah. That's what I hit my stride. That's what I hit my stride. <laughs> okay. Those are your peak working hours, or just peak yeah, pretty fun much. Hours? Yeah. Peak, peak probably working hours, like, I don't know, like sewing or on the computer. Or... Right. You can't be bothered at, the, at that time. It's pretty quiet. I mean, I, I'll, I'll be, sometimes I'll be sleeping during that time, too. But, yeah, usually, yeah. you know, if it's a weekend, I almost guarantee I'm working at that time. <laughs> That's great. Can you speak multiple languages? And if not, um, is there a language you want to learn? I can speak a little bit of Spanish. Um, I took that for four years in high school. And I am learning French right now. Um, I'm just finished, I'm about to finish my first semester of French and I continue to learn that. Uh, this is my first year of learning French. So eventually I'd like to be trilingual, fairly fluent in all three of them. Obviously not all, including English, so yeah. fluent in all three of those languages. 
but yeah uh, yeah in addition to those three um i'm not sure what language i would pick i mean those three are keys that can unlock a lot of doors so let's see, i yeah. think three's i'd like to, enough yeah, three yeah. yeah three is i mean there's some of these so much stuff i wouldn't do already i mean but right <laughs> learning you know that many languages to a proficient level is yeah, yeah. It's, it's not gonna happen until i'm like 20 something but yeah yeah you gotta know your limits the reason i asked and we'll get into this later but i saw a lot of french references so i was oh, just yeah, curious yeah. to know if you speak any french mm-hmm. and i guess that's something you're learning right now or like mm-hmm. we'll get into it later but i want to ask yeah. what got you interested into it so we'll, we'll hold off on that how many yeah, siblings yeah. do you have? We could go down that rabbit hole later. Um, I have three sisters. I have one older sister and two younger sisters. Very so, cool. Very much, yeah. Which I think it definitely helped me growing up a little bit. To, uh, tapping the career, my creative side a little bit more. Yeah. And this was a question that I got from watching a TV show, and I thought it was actually a really good one. And it was, what played a bigger part in shaping you, nurture or nature? So what I mean by that is like, do you think it was the people who really supported you and kind of gave you different perspectives? Or do you think it was kind of your surroundings and being able to go and get your own perspectives? I think it was nature, to be honest, because when I look at myself and who I am, I realize how much of a product of, you know, where I came from, like a lot of... Uh, I I very much love like practicality and I don't I don't favor ostentation too much. Um, I'm not super flashy. I, like those are all very Midwest values, and I guess those have obviously you need people to instill those values. But I think also environment kind of not that I'm like an old school or anything. I'm not an old head. I'm not a traditionalist or anything by any means. But those inclinations are definitely there. So I'd say probably yeah, nature. Um, yeah, definitely some nurture sense. though. I, yeah. 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 I don't want to get too deep about, no. about it, but yeah. But I think you it. answered the question. Yeah. And what's another interest that you have that's as equally, I guess, important to you as fashion? Um, pirate history, definitely. <laughs> okay. I was not expecting <laughs> that. Yeah, it's kind of a random thing, but um like pirates are definitely very fascinating to me like and they're not just like swashbuckly like jack sparrow like (laughs) they were like yeah there's yeah there's a lot of stuff i could get into about pirates that are very fascinating just these that they were forces to be reckoned with on the fringes of society there's a lot of cool interplay with like socioeconomic policy and and there's there's another rabbit hole (laughs) my gosh All right, well, I think we've learned quite a bit about you already, but now's the part of the episode where we get to dive into the reason you're on the podcast, which is to talk about Mm -hmm. some of the businesses that you're working on and what you have planned for the future. So what got you into fashion? So I've always been into fashion for its power of self-expression and self-authentication. I wasn't like huge into certain brands until I got older, but but, so I've always been into clothes for their self-expressive quality, but um, it kind of grew into, um, I've always been like, I've always had like secondhand clothes and hand-me-downs. So naturally you can buy those thrifting. So I did enjoy that growing up. And then that kind of got the foot in the door for my me buying myself my clothes on um, my I'd see stuff at the store and my mom would you know let me get them or so whatnot but when I really started getting my own style and whatnot is when I started thrifting thrifting is like the biggest thing that got me into fashion I like especially freshman sophomore year of high school um keep in mind this is in Iowa this is back when like there was this transition it's still occurring when thrifting was kind of looked down upon now it's you know pretty normal for youth to do but for a while especially in Iowa it was kind of looked down upon but for me it was really kind of liberating in the way I could find like clothes and no one else had and I could find stuff that really spoke to me because a lot of the stuff I was finding was like very old and 
you know, from the seventies or older um, for I Iowa, for some reason has a density of super, super old clothes compared to, you know, maybe your local thrift store at a big city, I guess it's just uh, how old the population is, but um, yeah, that's definitely what really got me into clothes and really got me paying attention to brands. Um, I'd say the first big figure for me was there's this YouTuber named Paul Cantu. Um, he was, he's like the OG thrifting YouTuber. Um, I used to watch him a lot. And the way I found him on YouTube actually was um, when I first started getting into sneakers and I first got into sneakers from, hmm, that's a tough one. Cause my dad had a pair of Carmine sixes back in the day. And I was like, that got me into the Jordan rabbit hole. I was like, huh, what are those? So, and then I was watching a uh, bull TRC, I think is his name, his sneaker YouTuber. And then Paul Cantu was recommended because uh, it was like thrifting for Jordan's video. And then that kind of like made me realize that thrifting can be profitable. Like these clothes I love finding anyway, I can sell them for a little bit of money on the side. So that kind of got me into the business side of fashion. That was kind of the foot in the door. It's not exactly, you know, fashion industry. You know, but it is making clothes off of money. And that really refi started refining my taste because I would I'd go thrifting like four or five times a week. And I still do. And, you know, you really refine your own personal taste. And it's kind of a fun way to you can almost see trends as they happen because fashion loves to reference its own history. So you can kind of see things in the thrift store, maybe buy it and then you post it and then you see it get, gets a lot of feedback on Depop or eBay or whatever. And then, you know, you find more of a similar style and post those too. And then, like, especially with the Y2K thing, I kind of, there's a lot of Y2K stuff in my area, like Sean John and Echo and all that. And I've, I've been selling that for years and now it's like, I can only keep that stuff for like a day anymore. It just flies so fast, but um. Yeah, that's basically where I got into fashion. And um, too, I feel like an important kind of um, fact to know is that my mom used to work at a Macy's. So I've always had like cool quality clothes. I didn't have like designer, but I had um, like very nice quality, like Ralph Lauren and Tommy Hilfiger from the 90s when their stuff was in their prime. I always think about this one corduroy Ralph Lauren hat I had. Um, I would say I was a pretty well-dressed kid. I loved to dress myself as a kid. Um, Oh, I, I'd either wear like something Ralph Lauren or like just some Lego Star Wars graphic tee. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what it was pretty much. But looking yeah, back on those, pictures, and then too, like a lot. Yeah, I was gonna say, looking back on those pictures, you always wish that you had those clothes today. Do you mm, ever go back yeah, and try to find some of those same clothes? Yeah, I do, and I was looking for that Ralph Lauren hat recently, specifically because you know it was like it was an I think an adult sized hat. I'm pretty sure because I remember wearing a freshman year of high school too, like yeah. this summer, but I couldn't find it. I must have left it somewhere. My last time I remember seeing it was at um, freshman year of high school. So it's yeah. probably long gone. But the nice thing is um, you can find a similar one on eBay. It might take a while to find, but right. I mean, you can definitely find stuff like that. And um, too, growing up, I just always had like super fond memories attached to different garments and I feel like everybody does you know um like specifically um my uh, grandpa has this 1960s or 1970s um green Pendleton button shirt and I just have fond memories of that one it's too small for me now sadly but you know just things like that you know you like that hat I was talking about the Ruffler Laurent hat um ever since that hat like I, I've had that for a long time and now corduroy is my favorite material just because that hat was corduroy so right um, it's interesting to hear about all your connections to fashion and I just want to reiterate for the listeners some of the businesses that you're working on right now which is the your clothing brand which is the historical reinterpretations it's the HRMTG and then it's yes. and then your vintage clothing stores. It's backed by popular demand. And then you also yes. have Jack B. Weiss. We Jack, hold on. Jack, Jack B. Weiss. Weiss. Yeah. Jack B. Weiss yeah, design, yeah. which is yes. your you providing 
creative services and also technical services to fashion mm -hmm. creatives. Yes. Okay, cool. So we're going to get more into kind of your clothing brands, the, the one that you've been producing. And I want to ask you, what technology apps do you use to design or what other resources help you in your design process? So my design process really starts with books and research. Um, my clothing brand is really a child of books and kind of just aesthetic research. Um, I am a huge history buff, I'd say. Not necessarily a fashion history buff. I do love fashion history, but it's more so art history and just the anecdotal aspects of history, like history as a story. Um, and I have I have a bunch of books, but there's this one book in specifically that kind of birthed the brand. It's called Tiger Sprung. But anyway, long story short, it starts with books, I'd say. And I'll read the books. The books kind of act as an impetus for ideas that will just come to my head. So I don't like read with the purpose of design. Um, also, too, another place that designs can start from is just at the thrift store or, you know, just out and about. Or um, I get a lot of inspiration from just random things. I've got whole albums on my phone of just random things. And then the next step is usually I usually just go straight to Adobe Illustrator after that. Um, I do love using references to reference images. Um, but I'd say my primary tool is Adobe Illustrator. I do have a lot of. Uh, fashion design books, fashion or design resource books um, and to help me with the technical side of things because I'm not a walking library. I can't memorize, you know, all the seams and all the stitches when I'm making my tech packs and whatnot. So, uh, but my biggest tool is Adobe Illustrator. Um, I use Photoshop once in a while, but it's mostly Adobe Illustrator. And I do do sketches with just pen and paper sometimes, but it's that's only when it's a little bit more complicated and I need to establish the overall fit more, but definitely Adobe Illustrator. I love Adobe Illustrator. I could, uh, that was my yeah. first program I ever played with. And Adobe Illustrator will forever have my heart. <laughs> definitely. I want to ask for personal reasons. What's the process? I guess I'm probably going to go up and look up a video on it later, but what's the process for turning something from, an illustrator sketch to the live or like more realistic pictures that you create for people. Are you, are you talking about like the 3d mockups? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like getting a flat sketch to like a 3d mockup. Right. Um, so that would be, um, I make the 2d sketches. I don't do 3d. I would love to, um, but that'd be on, um, Clo 3d. I think it's called CLO 3d. Um, and there's another, there's a number of other design programs, but basically you would take that flat sketch and then you'd probably go to a pattern maker and then you can make, you can put the pattern into this Clo 3D program and then we'll sew it in like 3D and then you can see it as like a 3D model uh, for stuff like basic 3D t-shirts. Um, you can, people can do those in like, um, I think in the name it starts with a B, but it's a it's a free 3D design program. But really, um, the 2D sketch, if you're gonna go to 3D, it's kind of just a reference for fit. The 2D sketches are more so for the factories than they are for the 3D. Um, right. I guess the 3Ds are for the factories too, but most factories I think prefer the 2D, um, just because it's a lot less storage on devices. Like even tech packs themselves can take up so much storage because I've, I've made tech packs that are like 30, 40 pages long. Wow. And like you get all the images on there and the artworks and the, but yeah, they can be a lot. So, but yeah, in terms of getting them from 2D to 3D, it really depends on like what the end goal is because I know a lot of brands now will do like the 3D mock-up for, you know, their posts or whatnot or just kind of the aesthetics of them. And um, I don't really think the 2D would have a whole lot of help on that um, i mean 2d is good to see like the fit and all that right 
but yeah, 3D is very interesting. I, I do definitely want to learn 3D. I tried learning it for a little bit, but I just wasn't wasn't consistent enough with it. So in yeah, the man. future, though, one day in the future, though. All right. Well, I may need your help in the future with that. So that'd be great. Next, I want to ask you, how did you learn digital design? Is that, and I guess, how did you learn design in general and fashion in general? Is it all stuff that you kind of went through rabbit holes and just went on different kind of tangents in learning things? What was the, Mm -hmm. how did that all formulate? So I started, I believe with you know the foot in the door youtube like how to store a streetwear brand and then i yeah, just kind of continue going around the route down the rabbit hole and my biggest resources thus far have been books i cannot stress how helpful books can be because people on youtube are only willing to tell you so much i mean they and rightfully so probably i mean they spend so much time and money to get this knowledge that they just can't give it all away for free so books are a huge resource and a lot of books i've gotten have um, like resources you can download onto your computer too so definitely books um i do i still do learn a bit from youtube podcasts too podcasts are huge because podcasts i can always listen to while i do something else while i'm in the car Um, I like to take notes while I listen to podcasts sometimes Um, just to help me remember things, but definitely like books and podcasts. I say those are the top two. And then I wish I knew more people in the industry. I know a few, but um, that I email back and forth once in a while with, but yeah, maybe one day I'll, I'll make more connections. And I do know a lot of like streetwear connections, but in terms of like fashion, fashion connections, because there is, somewhat of a disparity in like the technical applications i mean a a full-on fashion designer is going to know a little bit more of the technical side than somebody who is like a streetwear owner so i would like to make more fashion industry connections and i made a few that are really good but yeah definitely um definitely yeah uh, books and books and tests are definitely the biggest and don't be afraid to invest in books because i i buy a lot of fashion school books like fashion school textbooks so a lot of them can be a hundred plus each but i assure you it is well worth it because it has given me the base knowledge i need to do what i do and strive for what i strive for it's it's something you don't want to cheap out on definitely um and not even just like instructional fashion books too i would i would invest in like art and design books i've got books on you know stuff that isn't super super interesting to me but it's just still good to be aware of in terms of art and design um don't only just get fashion design books i would say too but yeah definitely definitely books and resources or books and podcasts are the best resource i'd say yeah from hearing you talk i think I can also agree that books are one of those things that you can kind of deem as priceless, even though you can buy them for a certain price in the end, it's whatever, like you kind of get out of it or what you take from it. And it can push you and give you maybe um, the ability to do something that you've never been able to do for like do before. So it's definitely something that you should invest in and not everybody likes it, but in the end, it's Mm. definitely it. There's an added value for sure. I want to ask Mm -hmm. what is, what's been like the most challenging thing to design? Hmm. Sometimes it sounds counterintuitive, but sometimes just the t-shirt or the hoodie. I mean, like if you're making a completely new style garment or you're doing something a completely new way, you know, it's pretty easy because, you know, you have the idea Whereas if you're doing graphics on a t-shirt or a hoodie, there's, I mean, there's so many, so many, so many different ways you can reinvent it. Yeah. Um, but in terms of like technical, um, recently I did a pair of like flare cargo pants, like zip off. They weren't crazy hard to design or anything, but I also have to do the back end of that and explain what's going on technically. Um, right. So that was that was the most difficult so far. I mean, difficult is probably a light word because I've yet to really do projects that are entirely out there. Um, I don't really 
typically take on those kind of jobs because, I mean, I'm just not suited to those yet. Um, when I feel comfortable with those kind of jobs, I'll take them on. Um, like I wouldn't trust myself with a tailored jacket or anything like that. Like any, like I do streetwear stuff. Like streetwear stuff is never too far out there. Like I'm not doing like avant-garde stuff, but definitely in the future I do. Um, I'm working on a project right now that is fairly complicated just because it is my first time. It's a personal project. It's not something I got hired to do. It is a, um, it's like a leather um, toe bag. That's a little, it's a little out there for me because this is, this is my first bag. Um, I'm kind of, I like to do stuff myself just to try to force myself to learn. Um, I could outsource that to another designer, but I'd rather learn that myself or learn how to do, because accessories are pretty much their own category in terms of fashion design. Um, most people who, most people who do accessories only do accessories, but I kind of want to force myself to learn that. And I also want to learn like belts and all that kind of leather goods. I want to learn how to do leather goods in terms of technical design too. So I'm kind of forcing myself to learn. I'd say that's the most difficult one I'm working on right now. And also I'm working on learning the technical side of shoes. I can draw shoes and I can draw bags all day, but in terms of technically explaining what's going on and making something that can, you know, actually be made is a whole nother thing. Um, but yeah, I'd say the shoes and then the, that bag that I'm working on are the most difficult, but those will be out hopefully this summer. That'll be cool to see. Going back to the, when you were talking about designing t-shirts, I think it's one of those things where I guess also relating to an artist, you never really know when it's finished. You really never know if like you need to change something, you need to change the color. It's really hard to determine what the finished thing is. Like, do I need to add one more paint stroke to this? Do I need to add, do I need to make it a little bit thicker on the font? Like you never really know when the process is finished compared to if you're designing a new garment, you kind of have the idea of how it's going to look in the end. So I think that's definitely one yeah. thing that seems challenging. Yeah, I feel like, um... I don't know. I don't know if this is a real thing, but I feel like I'm a better 3D designer than I am a 2D designer. And I don't mean that maybe it could be applied in that actual physical way, but a good example probably would be like a canvas versus a sculpture. I feel like I could do make a completely new thing and new shape easier than I could make something on a canvas, if that makes sense. Um, I feel like that's just, it's a little bit easier for me to make something new versus kind of upon a 2D plane, make something that's the same. Not that you can't change up t-shirts, but I mean, realistically, how much can you change up on a t-shirt versus if you make almost an entirely new garment, then you have a little bit more freedom. I'm not super good with constraints, but I think I don't know, it really point. depends on Sometimes yeah. I do like constraint. It really depends. I don't think I'm that limited. I, I said t-shirt is probably uh, probably the wrong example, but um, it made a lot of sense. To I'd me. say yeah, I'd say more so like yeah. I prefer like new garments or just like things that aren't t-shirts, just because I do them all the time, <laughs> right? For other brands, so it it is nice to do other things. But I mean, I'll, I'll do t-shirts too. I'll do t-shirts all day. Um, yeah. I know that you've Everybody dropped, I know you've dropped one collection titled Prelude. Is that the only collection mm -hmm. that you've dropped so far? Or what's really, what's your, what's your history looking mm -hmm. like? So for HRMTG, my first drop was, I believe in June. Yes, it was called Prelude. And that was kind of a test drop because I don't want to, you know, create a bunch of waste and garments when nobody actually wants it. And that was just t-shirts and I believe just shorts. And I just did another drop this last Monday. Um, it's not, no like particular name. I, I just called it drop two. And that was uh, three pairs of sweatpants, three hoodies. I re-released the t-shirts and the original shorts I dropped. And then a long sleeve shirt and two beanies. And I also did a like silk screen necklace um and that was i believe everything 
anything from this drop. But yeah, that that opened Monday, um, and pretty much everything's almost gone already. So I'm that's great. Happy with Congrats. It. Yeah, thank Very you. cool. I actually, uh, I actually did a pop up at my school. <laughs> uh, I'm like October 26, so a little over a month ago now. Yeah, was that something you organized, or was it kind of organized by your school? Yeah, and you got involved in it, or what? Yeah, I organized it with my school. Um, I reached out to them and said, like, yo, I do. I had some vintage stuff, and I had some stuff for my clothing brand out there. Um, because I. I don't really like sitting on stuff for my brand. Like I'd rather see it out in the world. Like I, I hear designers say this all the time and I definitely agree that seeing your stuff out in the world is perhaps the biggest reward of design. Like seeing something actually put on your garments because when you wear something, you kind of throw a little bit of your social credibility behind it. You throw, you're basically co-signing the garment and the brand that you're wearing like by wearing it and so to see right. like somebody trust themselves in my brand like you, you're not going to wear a brand that you know you're going to get shamed for or i mean if you don't care then you will but you know there's a lot more than just putting on a garment like you're basically co-signing it so it is cool to see people wear my clothes like it that's it's like the highest form of appreciation basically because people can like something but you know, I like a lot of clothes, but there's a lot of clothes I won't wear just right. because it's not me. So it's like the biggest cosign when somebody yeah. actually wears your clothes. So it was cool. Like I, I did a lot more because my clothes are a higher price point just because they are made in the USA. So I was kind of afraid that um, nobody ended up buying anything because it is a college campus. You know, there's not exactly the most um free spending money here <laughs> right. on a college campus so i was a little worried about that but it, it still did really good it did better than my vintage stuff surprisingly um but yeah it was a fun day and just good to get brand awareness out there i definitely want to do more pop-ups in the future like like big city pop-ups like new york city i want to do one in dc i live by dc about an hour south of dc so i want to do one in dc this summer i want to do I want to for sure do LA this summer too, probably just to get that brand awareness out there because I, I love physical experiences, um, like in-person experiences. Those are so much more potent, more powerful than just seeing something on Instagram. Like, yeah, it's, it's more accessible to do. It's cheaper to do, but I want to invest heavily in in-person experiences because I feel like the memory with that is just more, it's just going to be retaining Valuable. more. Yeah, like it's, you can feel the fabrics, you can smell the fabrics, you can see all the packaging. I invest heavily into packaging and all that. So it's something you can't really see on like a product picture or even you can like post your, I've posted my packaging before, but it's not as, or it's not as powerful when you see it in person as with anything really, but especially garments and fashion and presentation and storytelling and even though I just had a little booth like outside, it was so fun to have people come into like a little space that is kind of like your own little world, I guess. Um, it's kind of grandizing the little table that we had and like a few racks of clothes and like a carpet or something. But uh, I definitely want to do like physical stores and retail in the future. That is a huge goal of mine. No, it definitely sounds like you're really just making things happen and not really looking at it as like, oh, should I do this? Should I not do this? But you're really just committing to everything, being very experimental. And I don't think that's at all bad. And I think there's a lot to gain mm -hmm. from every experience that you do. So definitely keep on with that journey. Mm -hmm. We have quite a few more questions I want to get through. So let's dive into the next one, which is why the European references or like, why did you gravitate towards the Victorian era? So those historical references really reflect the, like I said, the birthing of HRMTG, um, specifically that Tiger Sprung book I was talking about. It's a book that covers fashion's kind of credence with modernity, and it's a very like deep book on fashion, and it's a deep dive into its relation and the expression of the human and kind of its relation with different epochs and they had a case study in the book and the case study was I believe it started in the 1840s and it went out all the way until the early um, 20th century and they just talked a lot in the books about 
um, kind of like, yeah, the Victorian era, the 16th century, the 17th century. And me too. Um, I love that era of history. Like I'm a huge history buff. So growing up, I always saw, saw those, like those woodcuts and those engravings and those prints. And they just represent a certain enigma to me. I don't know. There's just like a certain mystery to them. It's kind of unexplainable, like a certain, yeah, like a certain mystery or a bit of surrealist imagination with them, dream potential. It's it's kind of hard for me to explain, but it's very, yeah, like very mysterious to me. And it's very fascinating because a lot of the times those illustrations, those fashion illustrations, they weren't real people. They weren't like actual dresses. They were just dresses imagined by whoever created that woodcut or that engraving. Uh, like, I don't know if you saw my dress t-shirt or the t-shirt that had the dress on that. Like that garment never actually existed. And um, for some reason, I just think that's so fascinating. And in my head, I always make up these like backstories for, you know, these people on my garments. And um, yeah, just because I've always loved that era of history. Um, not to emulate it, like I'm not going to be creating, you know, like petticoats and bustle dresses and all those things. But I think it's just fun to reference such an old thing. So, you know, vividly, like it's on the huge on a t-shirt, but kind of clash it with modern um, pieces, like on a t-shirt, like, like here's a, you know, 18th century bustle dress on a t-shirt, you know, from a streetwear brand. I think that's kind of a fun clashing that you know, I, yeah. I always I always say um, eternal plus ephemeral equals ethereal. That's kind of the brand motto. Um, yeah, yeah it, it's just like, I think it represents a fun mystery um, just to have that. It's something I have sometimes I'm not able to explain fully because it's so like internalized and it's so I haven't been asked to, to articulate your, as much. Yeah, it's very unique to you and your kind of fascination and maybe what yeah. intrigued you that not too many people mm. really understand unless they were you. Mm. So it's very personalized, yeah, but it's um, also something that you, you've you been able to share in mm. your messaging and in the brand as a whole like your ethos it really seems like you really just want to kind of give a reinterpretation also just kind of bring this into the modern world mm. it's really cool i think of it um i think of hrmtg as kind of a lens piece through which i can view the past of fashion and kind of looked at from the viewpoint of modern times and i'll shift my you know where my telescope is like maybe every few seasons right now, it's just on, you know, French 1780s fashion. Also too, the reason I have a lot of those references is because I just, that's one of the times I know most about, um, you know, French history from Louis XIV to the end of Napoleon. That's probably the most I'm well, it's probably the one I'm most well-versed in. So that's what I felt most comfortable referencing. Um, and certainly in the future, as I get more resources and a little bit more knowledge, I'll start to reference more things. But I also um, reference Don Quixote a lot, too, uh, just for symbolic reasons. Um, and it, it, it's conducive to the overall theme. Um, I use a lot of historical woodcuts and engravings and um, kind of recreate them and um, play with them and personalize them to the brand and me. I changed some details, but I, I think sometimes of myself as the curator in terms of HRMTG, in terms of the graphics, because it's like I'm putting these art pieces on display and all these fashions on display. But yeah, I think of it as like a view piece through which I view the past um, and kind of just put it on display for modern audiences. And I like to keep things ambiguous so people can have their own interpretations of what that garment means or what that image means. I don't like to put a lot of words with my graphics because it allows that uh, reinterpretation to remain open. If you provide context for, if you provide too much context um, for the graphic, then its interpretation is kind of made for them already. So by just having, oh, here's just 
a giant knight on these shorts. Here's Don Quixote on these shorts. Then it's kind of up to the viewer to see what that means. And obviously, you know, they can still interpret it as one thing, even if it has words. But I feel like by leaving it devoid of words, and they can come up with their own interpretation. And then it can be more personal to the govern or to the viewer. Another goal of HRMTG is to kind of strengthen the individual's relationship with their clothes and make it more personal to them. Um, be more self-expressive, not just make them a part of some clique or you know some overall group that uses clothes just to fit in. I wanna empower the individual. And I, I think I can do that by making more individual garments. Um, I like to play with my print making and I like to make the prints a little bit different on each like a lot of them are faded they look faded uh, i like to do like faded prints so i'll make them um, like every piece is a little bit different no piece is the exact same and it'll be hard to do that once i scale up to you know a larger factory and whatnot but i will you know retain some sort of individuality i like to have individuality in the garments to kind of help strengthen that message of individuality in the wearer i learned a lot uh, hearing you talk about how your brand is basically your creation of this historical knowledge that you're getting. That's actually a very unique outlook on kind of how you put all this together. And I think it's definitely mm -hmm. something that I found very fitting and made a lot of sense to me. So that's really cool. I want to ask you, it appears like you put a lot of effort and time into your packaging. What do you want the customer experience to be? I want them to be surprised at how much packaging there is. I I want them to remember it too. Uh, I don't know if this is a thing that normal people remember, but for some reason, whenever I open a really cool package, I just remember it. Um, I feel like that's a pretty normal thing. Um, like even from non-luxury brands or non-clothing brands, amazing packaging can just elevate the product so much. You can't have you know, a, a second tier product in, you know, God tier packaging, that's not going to, you know, rectify bad products. But like one of my favorite examples in my head is, I believe it's like Harry's Blades or something like that. Like I opened a package of a Harry's Blades from Costco and for some reason I was blown away at the package. It was just so <laughs> cool. Um, I've gotten a couple of pieces from Cartier recently in the packaging and that of course was amazing. Um, but yeah, like elevated packaging just creates just an elevated experience, an elevated story. It, it feels like you're getting a part of a world. So I want my customer to feel like they're getting a piece of the HRMTG world. And I like to think of the HRMTG world as like a collage of just different, you know, historical motifs and styles and whatnot so i want to feel like they're getting a piece of the hermitage collage basically um i uh i print the packaging it's got the horse on the package it's got custom tape it's got a custom zip bag every purchase comes with a poster like a very large um, poster of the woman in the dress so, and it's very stark, like black and white. So it kind of fits the black and white uniformity of everything. Um, very like ambiguous, and just a little logo in the corner. Um, so yeah, so I want them to feel like they're getting something because I feel the product deserves that the good packaging that, that it has. I don't want to ship stuff in just like a great envelope I got from Amazon or something. I think it deserves to have something. And then too, in the mind of the customer, it's going to be that much more elevated because they got such good packaging. Another um, piece of advice too, I would have for clothing brand owners is to really do consider packaging because it really can elevate your experience. You don't want to cheap out on, oh, I'm just going to use these generic envelopes. You definitely want to do, you want to go the extra mile. And don't forget though, to include it in your product cost because uh, packaging can be expensive. It's very expensive for me. So you just need to consider that when you do your cost. 
and be sure to calculate that in. I've seen some really cool packaging from streetwear brands, um, just like custom wax seals and just stuff like that. Like stuff that's really cool, stuff that's fun, stuff that really goes with the story because packaging is, you're not done when you design the garments. You have to design a whole unique experience. Sometimes I like to think of myself as an experienced designer because clothes are just one aspect of that design process. I feel like I am an experienced designer and a world designer because, you know, from start to finish, it really should be a unique experience. So that's product uh, delivery is and product packaging is kind of like the last step of their last they're like it's like their last stop in that world so and it's arguably the most important because you know they're not seeing the product for a long time and they'll have depending on you know like i'm a small brand so i hopefully can shatter their expectations hopefully by looking at your packaging i could definitely tell that you put a lot of thought into it one thing i was thinking about while you were talking about your experiences opening packaging and how it kind of led you to wanting to create this experience for your customers was the idea that when you buy shoes, you keep the shoe box and mm-hmm. literally yeah. you're keeping something that probably costs like a penny when your shoes are probably mm-hmm. also cost, even though they cost $30, but they're the main thing you bought, you didn't buy the box. But then when you damage the box, you're like, mm-hmm. oh no, it's all this value that's lost. But really, it really mm-hmm. just has to do with kind of how we perceive that whole experience and that whole, um, Mm -hmm. not just the product, but also the packaging, which is definitely a unique Mm -hmm. way to look at it and definitely puts into perspective. Yeah. It definitely puts into perspective how valuable each level of the process is, each different facet of the process is. I want to ask you about your move to support free arts NYC and Mm -hmm is is giving back and is social responsibility something you always want to incorporate and why is it something that you want to place value on yes so that organization i found when i right before i started the brand i'd say um it's just me raising awareness for them and donating some money to them and in the future when it's official like official collaborations i will donate a portion of sales um to them but i just like to have that fundraiser in my bio and you know i I like to donate a portion of sales um just intermittently when um i feel like i like to have goals and i like to donate a certain amount but it's important to me to have even just barely raising awareness for a brand, like I'm a very small brand right now, but even the little awareness that I do raise and, you know, every once in a while I have strangers donate money from my bio and that goes directly to Free Arts NYC. And that feels almost better than people buying my clothes because, you know, you don't get anything out of donating to them. I mean, you get a good feeling, but it's not, that's nothing tangible. Whereas when you buy from me, you get a physical product. So you have something to show for it, something physical to show for it. So it almost means more to me when people donate through that bio to you know, Free Arts NYC, because obviously it goes to a good cause. And their mission aligns with mine of kind of just um, fostering creativity and self expression and you know, freedom through self expression, all that kind of thing. So, Hopefully, once I get to a certain level, then I can do official pieces with them and official, you know, maybe events in New York City or something like that. But it's very important to me now, uh, even at this extremely small stage, even before I started, um, I think I had like stuff about them on my Instagram just because um, I'm in the stages of building my foundation for I want HRMT and HRMTG to be a long term thing. So, you know, if that if those notions of you know creating social goodwill and you know creating positive impact aren't in the foundation that i can't just tack them on later down the line because people are asking what are you doing for the world like it needs to be in the foundation it's very important to me that and especially now with like even environmental and social we're getting to a point where brands almost every brand i feel should be supporting something um like it shouldn't just be for my own pocketbook or for whatever X, Y, and Z financial gain reason. It should be, yes, it can be partly that, but it should also support some good. 
Um, and I prefer social good right now just because I'm not, you know, I'm not too, too educated in sustainability right now. It's definitely, um, I make everything domestically, but um, in the future, I'll, I plan on doing stuff with, um, say you buy, say you buy an item um, and then a tree will be planted. I definitely have plans for stuff like that in the future, but for now, I, I just support uh, Free Arts NYC. Uh, but it's very, uh, it's, like I said, it's very important to have that now, just so it's always part of the brand, the brand DNA. Um, you know, like when you're born, your DNA exists inside of you. You know, you can't really alter it after you're born. So I just prefer to have it in there now so that I can always be about it. I don't want to, like, say 20 years down the line, have to change, try to change the brand morals or anything. I just want them to be solid from the get go and then, you know, just grow authentically and have authentic ideals and because I one of my biggest pet peeves is when brands just say things to give lip service and they're not really about anything I don't like brands without ideals or brands that always just change their story depending on uh, what the zeitgeist has to, to be happens to be at that time so I just prefer to have a morally it's not a saint brand of course but um, definitely something that's a bit more on the positive side so that's great to hear and I think it's definitely something that's essential or valuable for everybody to do regardless of how big your platform is is to try mm -hmm. to support other people so whoever's listening to this podcast right now if you can just go and donate whatever you can to free arts nyc and how you can get there is either I'll link it in this episode description or you can go to What's the Instagram app for your webpage? I mean, for your Instagram. Yeah. HRMTG.XYZ. I have um, a donation link in the bio. And I also have the uh, donation link in my personal Instagram bio, which is Jack B. Weiss, W-I-E-S-E. -E. Or I'm sure you can just go directly to freeyardsnyc.org and donate there. Um, doesn't matter where you donate they get all the money so you know glad to hear any, any bit helps before rounding out this episode i want to ask how can people connect with your businesses and is there anything else you want to uh, leave off with uh, they can i'll go with the first one first they can find my uh, personal instagram uh, it's at Jack B. Weiss, J-A-C-K-B-E-W-I-E-S-E. -E. They can find my vintage Instagram at ITS, backed by popular demand. Also on Depop, where I'm the most prominent. Um, Emma Chamberlain filed that like a little while ago, so that was huge for that one. Um, it's just backed by popular demand, at backed by popular demand. Uh, they can find my clothing brand, uh, hrmtg.xyz on Instagram. The website for that is ouiwe-hrmtg.com. Uh, most of the stuff is sold out, but we still do have some items. And then they can find my design Instagram at Jack B. Weiss Design. Same way my name is spelled, just add design at the end. And all those links are also in my personal Instagram. That's kind of the the main sign for that. So you can pretty much find anything I do from there. Um, and last message, don't let people stop you from doing anything. I don't know, that's, that's corny, but definitely just do it, just do it. That's that's probably my last thing. Um, don't be afraid of failing. And also be patient, be patient. Sometimes stuff takes time. I know you wanna maybe start a brand right away or start a new business right away, but Sometimes a little patience can go a long way. I had my brand in the works for probably a year before I even, you know, sold a single thing, um, just conceptually building it out and making sure. And that way too, you don't get caught up with having the same name as somebody else because when it's something you're considering for a year, you can really come out the gate strong then. Um, you don't want to get too complacent on it though. You definitely want to start before is if you wait too long, then you can get into the problem of, okay, I'll just launch my brand in a month. Okay, I'll finally do it then. But just be strategic about it. You don't want to wait too long, but definitely um, sometimes patience can go a long way because you want to think long-term with your brand, unless it's really something that is just for a trend or 
a quick buck, but you, you shouldn't think long-term about your brand. So really build it strong out the gate really think about things about out the gate, think of things 10 years into the future and uh, you won't regret it. I promise you. And it's, it's definitely for the better. That's probably my last bit of advice for brand owners specifically, I guess. And uh, maybe for like, this is kind of more so in personal style, but thrift as much as you can, because that is the best way to find your own personal style. Um, and well, it's random advice, but yeah, no, closing, that was great. Closing statement. Thanks so much for joining me and talking to our listeners and me about what you have going on. I definitely learned a lot from it. And if you're not already, go follow the podcast on Instagram at Owens.exhibit. And you can also check the description of this episode for links to Jack's businesses. That'll all be on there. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah.